it is uh, six oh five now. So um, I think probably it's best to to slightly crack. We're getting a couple of stragglers, but we always uh, always do. But I think probably it's worth um, starting now. So thank you all very much for coming to this, which is our third talk in collaboration with the Anglo-Russian Research Network. This week, Ben Phillips talks about uh, Russian political emigres in London, 1881 to 1917. Um, ben Phillips is a lecturer in Russian at the University of Exeter. And um, as with all these um, le lectures, they're, they're based on um, a general theme of Russian British or Russian Anglosphere um, cultural interchange and on uh, a similar subject, uh, Ben has a book coming out next year called Inventing Revolutionary Russia, Siberian Exile and the Transnational Mythologies of Russian Radicalism, um, which is more about sort of uh, transnational than Anglosphere, but um, it's uh, similar to, to today's event. Um, the Anglo-Russian Research Network is uh, a group of uh, academics who um, are working in the sphere of Russian and Soviet culture and its influence on Britain and vice versa. Um, they are sort of back doing a few more seminars and are, I think, open to uh, sort of proposals. Um, so if you if you do have any proposals, do um, send them over. I think the contact details to submit them are on the event page that uh, you came from with this uh, event. Um, so without much further ado, I'll um, hand over to our speaker tonight, Ben Phillips. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Rafi, for the introduction. And can I just add to what you said that uh, if yes, if you do have any seminar or reading group proposals for the Anglo-Russian uh, Research Network, you can contact me directly or alternatively Nick Hall or Anna Mustyanova, who are both in this um, meeting. Anyway, um, thank you uh, very much, Rafi. Thank you uh, very much also to Pushkin House and indeed to the aforementioned Anna Mustyanova for uh, organizing this wonderful series of events. And uh, thank you, of course, to all of you for coming. So I'd like to start by, um, uh, sorry, Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having some trouble screen. Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, so I'd like to start by uh, quoting from a letter uh, written to the editor of the Times, but actually addressed to the British nation as a whole uh, in the summer of 1917 by the uh, Russian revolutionary and anarchist uh, Pyotr Kropotkin, who um, spent much of the latter part of his life living in London and Brighton in immigration. Uh, this is when he, he went back to Russia after the February the revolution and the collapse of the monarchy at the beginning of 1917. So he writes, Sir, may I ask you kindly to give me the hospitality of your columns for sending a farewell to the British nation and expressing my heartfelt thanks for the friendly reception I find in this country since the days when I landed on these shores in 1876 as a quite an unknown stranger down to the present day when I leave here so many personal friends. Their touching friendship has contributed so much to relieve the gloominess of a long exile that I deeply regret the impossibility of expressing my thanks personally. I regret it the more as I wish to express my gratitude, not only for the kindness which I and my family find in England, uh, but also for the sympathy that Russia, and especially young Russia, by young Russia he means revolutionary Russia, uh, find with a considerable portion of this country's population and its political leaders. Those of us who, who have lived it will, uh, through, will, will never forget the, the energy with which our friends took the, the defense of every Russian refugee whose extradition the, the Tsar's government tried to obtain, nor the friendly support which we find each time we appealed, be it for the relief of a famine, especially as in 1891, the relief of exiles in Siberia, the expression of sympathy with the attempt at throwing off the yoke of autocracy in 1905, or the vigorous protest against the atrocious repression that followed this attempt. Now, I think this letter is really interesting because there is, I think it's true to say, a widespread um, impression that there's received wisdom about political emigres in, in general, not just Russian ones, that because they don't want to be in the places that they end up, they don't ever form close bonds with their host country, and they un end up leading very sort of insular lives, mostly in the company of other emigres. Um, and Kropotkin's letter clearly suggests that this is not always or not exclusively 
uh, the case. And indeed, as I hope this talk will show, the history of the Russian emigration in London uh, before 1917 reveals uh, a lot, not only about the, the offstage action, so to speak, of the, the struggle against Tsarism, but also about the global reception of the Russian Revolution, the Russian revolutionary movement, um, the transnational history of the left at the turn of the 19th century, and the role played by uh, political emigres as um, cultural intermediaries. So, first of all, to, to give some historical context for this talk, we should say um, that for most of the 19th century, most of the, the long 19th century, London, uh, Britain in general, and London in particular, provided refuge for all manner of European revolutionaries, radicals, and democrats. Um, participants in the nationalist and democratic revolutions uh, that swept the continent in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars uh, and who fled political persecution at home almost invariably ended up at some point on the banks of the Thames. This tradition can be um, traced to the early 1830s when a not insignificant number of uh, Poles between 500 and 600 who had been displaced by the, the failed uh, nationalist uprising of 1830 1831 uh, chose London as their base. Um, but it was only in the years um, following the failed uh, revolutions of 1848 that London consolidated its position as Europe's preeminent destination for political emigres. Um, in the early 1850s, it played host to figures such as Giuseppe Mazzini, uh, Alexandre Le Duel, uh, Lajos Kostouf, and uh, also Alexander Herzen, of course, of uh, whom more shortly. And over the next couple of decades, the 1848 emigres were um, followed by many other generations, um, more Polish refugees this time from the, the failed uprising of 1863, uh, socialists and anarchists from the continent in the 1880s and the 1890s, um, Bundists fleeing the Pale of Settlement along with many other Jewish migrants uh, around the same time. And by the early 20th century, um, increasing numbers of anti-colonial revolutionaries from outside Europe have also uh, begun to make their presence felt. So why did political emigres come to London? Well, the first and by far the most important reason was the knowledge that they could not and they would not be denied political asylum in Britain. Prior to the passage of the 1905 Aliens Act, the British government made no attempt to register or to turn away migrants and consistently refused to entertain extradition requests from foreign powers. And although this policy often caused Britain problems in terms of its diplomatic relations with Europe, and indeed on one occasion uh, after the so-called Orsini Affair of 1858, uh, it brought uh, Britain and France to the brink of war, um, the policy uh, of total indulgence towards political refugees was fairly explicitly sanctioned by educated public opinion of the time. Um, the self-image of Victorian liberalism, that is of Britain is the home of constitutionalism and of liberty and the free press and so on and so forth, um, depended to a significant degree on the inverse image of the European powers as despotic. And in this context, playing host to political refugees from the continent uh, made quite a powerful statement. It said that British liberties and constitutional government um, were sufficiently robust uh, as to accommodate even the most dangerous um, foreign subversives. Um, as the Times wrote in its, uh, its leader of uh, 19th of January 1858, uh, it is part of our identity uh, to be the refuge of all nations. Nature itself has given us ports of every aspect and traffic with every clime. For our, our ancient fusion of many races and hospitality to many refugees, we derive both the precedent and, and the capacity for sympathizing with all the tribes of humanity and even all the phases of human opinion. We cannot pre prevent this metropolis from being what even Rome was described by its satirists, the sink of the human race. We cannot save our public fur affairs from the floods of vice poured in by neighboring states. For better or for worse, we have long been wedded to liberty and we take it with all its evils for the sake of its manifold blessings. Now, as this um, suggests the quote unquote official position that, that is of successive governments, both Tory and liberal, and a, a substantial chunk of public opinion as well, was that foreign refugees should be um, tolerated, but not exactly made welcome. By the same token, however, uh, we should also note that um, foreign emigres uh, also received a much more a warmer welcome from those elements of Victorian society that sympathised explicitly with their struggles against despotism and uh, for national self-determination. 
and here I, I mean most notably groups like like the Chartists in the the early nineteenth century, and later on the leading proponents of parliamentary reform in the eighteen sixties. But in any event, uh, political emigres had license uh, to operate with really considerable freedom in Britain during the mid to late nineteenth century. And many duly avail themselves of the opportunities for um, political activity, the security from extradition and police harassment on the continent, and the, the connections with uh, other emigres uh, that Britain in general and London in particular uh, offered them. Now, with some uh, exceptions, some notable exceptions, the, the Russians came late to this emigre milieu in London. It was not until the end of the 19th century that the escalating revolutionary situation in Russia forced large numbers of Russian oppositionists to seek refuge overseas. And even then, most of them preferred, whenever possible, to remain on the continent, uh, usually in Paris, Geneva or Zurich. Thus, uh, Mikhail Bakunin and Pyotr Lavrov, uh, who were two of the leading um, intellectual influences on the, the sort of pre-Marxist stage of the Russian revolutionary movement in the 1860s and the 1870s, uh, chose to spend their declining years in uh, Paris and in Switzerland, respectively, um, as did the emigre leadership of the People's Will opposition, Narodnaya Volya, uh, after 1881. And later on, uh, several notable Marxist emigres, uh, among them Georgi Plekhanov, uh, Vera Sasulic, and later still Lenin and Krupskaya, uh, also tended on the whole uh, to favour Switzerland as base. Uh, and there's many reasons for this, the major ones being on the whole greater familiarity with French as a language, um, the relative ease of um, escaping from Russia to the continent and thence returning to Russia. Um, and also the large number of uh, Russian expats, mainly students who were already in situ and in Switzerland especially. And in some respects then, for, for most of the mid -late to late 19th century, London is a more marginal destination. It is a convenient place to publish a couple of issues of your revolutionary newspaper if your printing press on the continent has been shut down. And in the early 20th century, it's a convenient place also to hold party conferences quite famously. The minority of Russians who stayed longer in London um, mostly did so reluctantly and for mainly pragmatic reasons. Um, sometimes the need to evade uh, capture and extradition uh, on the continent. Um, but just as often, and perhaps more importantly, the, the desire to evade the czarist censorship and to um, to speak freely uh, from the safety, as it were, of the other shore, to borrow Hertzson's famous metaphor, uh, to their countrymen at home. Uh, indeed, the early stages of the Russian emigration in London focused very heavily on publishing activities and on the dissemination of the so-called free Russian word. Um, as uh, Herzen, who's um, the first major Russian emigrated to camp to, uh, to London, and of course was one of the outstanding representatives of the early uh, Russian intelligentsia, wrote in 1853, um, why do we, i.e. Russians, remain silent. Do we really have nothing to say? Can it be that we keep quiet because we dare not speak? At home, Russians cannot speak freely, but their words could resonate elsewhere if only the time would come. The cause of free speech is a great one. Without free speech, man cannot be free. The time to publish in the Russian language outside of Russia, it seems to us, has arrived. Um, with these words, uh, Herzen, or Gertzen, I should say Herzen's the Anglicization, uh, announced the foundation of his uh, Free Russian Press, or Volnaya Ruska Typografia. The, the Free Russian Press was the first, um, the first ever uncensored Russian publishing house, and all told was probably the most important emigre press uh, of the 19th century. Uh, it was based on Judd Street in Bloomsbury, uh, a couple of minutes walk from King's Cross uh, Station, and these days a couple of minutes walk from Cease and of course Pushkin House. Um, and it shared its premises there uh, for a time with the Polish uh, Democratic Federation, uh, one of many Polish emigre organizations to be uh, uh, active in London at this time. Besides publishing uh, a really vast range of um, literature that Hibbert Hibbert had been banned in Russia, including the first editions of the Decemberist uh, memoirs, um, the Free Russian Press produced two serial publications uh, of great historical significance. Uh, the first of which was the historical almanac uh, Poliana Zvezda, or the Polar Star. And uh, the second, which you can see uh, here on the left, is the newspaper Kolokol, or the Bell. Uh, Kolokol was initially a supplement to Poliana Zvezda, 
uh, but in due course it became um, the most important serial publication of its time. It, it was the first uncensored newspaper ever widely, if illegally, um, distributed in Russia. And in effect, it was Russia's paper of record um, during the great reforms of the 1860s. And this uh, emigre publishing tradition uh, started by Herzen is later carried on by Lavrov's uh, socialist journal period, which you can also see here. And indeed, uh, again, famously by Lenin's newspaper, Iskra and indeed by numerous others. So in a word then, while Russian emigres of the late 19th century were certainly aware of uh, London's advantages as an emigre destination, most preferred to uh, visit only briefly or to avoid it uh, altogether. And yet it was nevertheless London that uh, became at the end of the 19th century, at least politically if not numerically, the most important European hub of the Russian revolutionary emigration. Um, and in part, this was um, because Britain was, at least by the 1890s, the only European bolt hole, so to speak, left to those who were determined to engage in political activities uh, during their time in emigration, as opposed to just whiling away uh, the months and years. At the end of the 1870s, the revolutionary struggle uh, in Russia against Tsarism had uh, accelerated dramatically. Uh, culminating, of course, in the assassination of Tsar Alexander II uh, by the People's Will Organization in March of 1881, uh, as you can see in this contemporary uh, illustration here. After this uh, seismic event, Russia enter entered a, um, a prolonged period of reaction and counter-reform, uh, during which the revolutionary movement, as it had existed uh, up until that point, was to a very great extent destroyed. Uh, most of its leaders were imprisoned or exiled to Siberia or were forced to flee overseas. The Tsarist regime was not content with even this resigning victory and it continued to pursue the revolutionaries abroad. Um, and by the end of the 1880s, um, the Russian authorities had duly uh, succeeded in disrupting or destroying nearly all emigre networks uh, on the continent. Um, this was um, uh, accomplished primarily through the work of the foreign agency of the, uh, the Akhrana, the Tsarist security police. Uh, which was founded in 1883 for the explicit purpose of doing battle with the emigres. Um, the foreign agency was directed from most of its existence by um, one Pyotr Rachkovsky, who's the, uh, the chap in the bowler hat you can uh, see here. Um, Rachkovsky is a notoriously effective and cynical spy master um, who had come of age as a young police detective um, during the original People's Will terrorist campaign of the late 1870s. During the 1880s, Rashkovsky worked to establish ties with all of the major European uh, police forces, at least on the continent, and to establish um, permanent Okhrana residencies in uh, most European capitals. And by the end of the decade, uh, his ruthless counterintelligence work had resulted in the defection of the, um, the senior revolutionary Lev Tikhomirov, uh, who'd been a leading participant in the plot to kill the Tsar. Uh, and also in the expulsion of um, all Russian emigrants from Switzerland uh, and the ensnarement in a contrived um, terrorist plot of several other Russian emigrants living in Paris. Um, and during this period, the, uh, the, Akhranas, the overseas Akhranas, uh work was also directed towards the disruption of uh, emigrant publishing activities on the continent. Um, when in November of 1886, uh, Russian agents uh, raided and destroyed a Geneva printing press operated by the emigre leadership of the People's Will, they effectively suppressed, at least for the time being, the last wellspring of the emigre publishing tradition that I've already mentioned that had been started by uh, Herzen in the, uh, in the 1850s. So by the end of the 1880s, the continent had become, uh, in a word, a distinctly inhospitable environment for Russian emigres. And those who were willing to, who were unwilling, I should say, to resign themselves to total inactivity uh, for the time being, were forced to consider their options. And it was primarily for this reason that growing numbers of Russian revolutionaries started to decamp to, to London uh, at the end of the 1880s. And London, by the way, is still at this point the one major European capital where the Okhrana have not established uh, any permanent presence. Now, in a way, this. Um, shift towards London as the one of the, the major geographical centres of the emigration is really fortuitous. Um, the growing importance of London actually opens up uh, a new front, so to speak, in the history of the Russian revolutionary immigration. 
the events of the uh, the late 1870s and of 1881 in particular had, of course, generated uh, quite naturally enormous interest uh, overseas. But the international response to the assassination of the Tsar was uh, by no means one of unanimous condemnation. Uh, in Britain especially, the chorus of shock and outrage was tempered once again by the suggestion that uh, political strife in Russia simply illustrated yet further the advantages of constitutional government. The Times, for example, in its leader, published after the news of, of Alexander II's assassination, uh, opined that the Tsar's death was, and I quote, yet another terrible illustration of the reality of the perils by which despotic authority is surrounded. Now, British public opinion throughout the 19th century, and as much as one can generalise, uh, had in any case been overwhelmingly hostile, at least to official Russia, to the Russian state. Tories regarded Russia as a strategic rival in, in the great game of empire, whereas liberals and radicals uh, tended to see the czarist autocracy as the enemy of liberty and progress. So in all of this, there is the, the clear insinuation that uh, although on the one hand, the violent methods employed by Russian revolutionaries could not be sanctioned, their cause and their struggle against despotism was nonetheless basically legitimate. Uh, and therefore growing international interest in the Russian revolutionary movement during the, uh, the early 1880s presents the London uh, emigres with an opportunity in effect to sell their movement and their cause to, and enlist both the moral and potentially material uh, support of the British public. There, there's a great article um, in European History Quarterly by Mike Hughes on exactly this topic for anyone who's interested. I don't, I don't know if Mike's here this evening. No, the, um, the first Russian emigrant to try taking advantage of this, uh, however, unsuccessfully, uh, was this chap you can see in the top right hand corner here. It was one uh, Liv Nikolaevich Gartman, or Hartman to the Anglophone press. Garthman had been a, a member of the People's Will organization, and uh, in 1879, he'd um, taken part in one of the first, maybe the first, um, assassination attempts on the Tsar. After this, he had promptly fled overseas to Paris, where he was appointed uh, the, um, the foreign representative of Nadal Novoya uh, in absentia by the party's executive committee. Um, he was... Um, but he was promptly arrested by the French police, but was let go after uh, after a little while. And after he's released, he goes to London, uh, where he, he stays in all for about a year. Uh, he left in June of 1881, uh, apparently in quite some haste after making an unsuccessful pass at Eleanor Marx. And he um, he wound up in New York, where he, uh, he abandoned revolutionary activity and uh, worked as an electrician. Um, given these biographical particulars, it's perhaps not surprising that Gartman is uh, today scarcely remembered even by specialists. Yet, in one important respect, uh, he was quite an, uh, a significant figure in the history of the London emigre colony. For uh, During his time in Britain, Gartman developed fairly grandiose plans uh, for an overseas propaganda campaign that in several important respects anticipated the later uh, activities of Russian emigres in Britain. Um, Gartman envisaged a, a, a central committee uh, which would be headquartered in London and would consist of himself and several other notable emigres at the time. He, he had in mind um, Krapotkin, uh, Lavrov and Mirza Zolich. Uh, and he, he thought that this committee should raise funds for and awareness of the revolutionary movement in Russia. Um, it would do this by organizing demonstrations and public lectures, and it would also publish an English language newspaper, uh, which would also come out with uh, French and Swiss editions. And this newspaper, in Gartman's words, would, uh, and I quote, show to the West an authentic picture of Russia's condition, her classes, parties, their mutual relations, and so forth. Now, I think Gartman's um, plans for a uh, foreign language. Um, uh, emigre newspaper are particularly interesting on two counts. Um, firstly, because it was explicitly intended, as he made clear in correspondence of the time, to present a very sort of sanitized, very westernized image of the Russian revolutionary movement as a kind of anod anodyne struggle for reform and liberty. Um, again, to, to quote from, from him, uh, the main thing, that this is Gartman writing to an, another emigre at the time, Nikolai Tchaikovsky. Uh, the main thing is that the tone and the character of the, of the articles in this newspaper should correspond to the spirit of the English. 
the second thing that I think is quite interesting here is that he he intends to publish this newspaper um, under the title Nihilist. Um, now, some of you will, of course, know that in in Russian, the term Nihilist um, denotes one very specific uh, phase in the history of the revolutionary intelligentsia, the generation of the 1860s to, to which Chernyshevsky and PCDF and uh, others belonged. But of course, in the English language by this time, the word nihilist had basically become a slang term for revolutionaries of all sorts. And in other words, therefore, Garton's big idea for kind of selling the revolutionary movement overseas is simultaneously to play down the more radical socialist aspects of the struggle against autocracy that he, he thinks might kind of disconcert foreign sympathizers, whilst also playing up to and exploiting the sort of cartoonish Im imagery of wild-eyed nihilists and this kind of thing that is at this point very widespread in Victorian popular culture and is, dominates the pages of the, the boy's own paper and what have you. And you know this, this kind of stuff obviously appeals to the Victorian melodramatic imagination, so to speak. Um, and, and this kind of media strategy, it should be said, was pretty much exactly that which had been um, employed for many years by um, Polish refugees uh, from the 1830 and 1863 uprisings. And therefore, it's uh, perhaps not surprising that um, Russian revolutionaries, who of course had close connections to the, the Polish underground, should it, in due course have adopted it um, themselves. Now, Garton's um, project for a newspaper uh, amounted to very little in practice. Um, two issues bearing very little resemblance to his original design and with which, of course, he, he um, being no longer on, had no involvement, uh, eventually were published in Paris in 1883. The proof of concept, however, was not long in coming. For the, the, in the years, um, so the years immediately following his uh, departure, so the mid to late 1880s, saw the arrival uh, in Britain of three of the most uh, important Russian emigres of the time. Uh, Krakotkin, whom I've already mentioned, um, the chap in the middle is uh, Sergei Kravchinsky, better known by his um, pen name Stipniak, um, and lastly uh, Felix Volkovsky on the right. So I'm going to give some brief biographical details of each one. Um, Krapotkin was a, of noble birth, he could trace his family's line of descent all the way back to Rurik, um, and he'd actually abandoned a, a, a brilliant career, potentially brilliant career in state service uh, in the name of his political convictions. Kropotkin uh, became involved in the revolutionary movement during the early 1870s. Um, and after a, a spell in prison in St. Petersburg, uh, he escaped overseas in 1876. Uh, his early years in emigration were spent uh, as usual, mostly in France and Switzerland, albeit punctuated by short stays in Britain in uh, 1876 when he first arrived in Europe. And again, 1881, 1882. Um, after another spell in prison, this time in France, he moved to Britain for good in 1886, and he stayed there um, until his return to Russia following the February Revolution of uh, 1917, as I, I say. And it was during his time in emigration that Kropotkin emerged as one of the major influences on the European socialist and anarchist movement, um, and also when he uh, he wrote his most important theoretical works, including The Conquest of Bread and Mutual Aid, and he generally became one of the most um, respected public intellectuals uh, of his time. Kravchinsky had also uh, been a participant in the the revolutionary events of the 1870s. I, I should say that all three of them had had very similar origins politically. Um, his claim to fame, however, um, was his status as the first quote unquote successful uh, revolutionary terrorist. Um, in August of 1878, shortly after Vidas Asulich's famous acquittal, um, Kravchinsky had assassinated the head of the Corps of Gendarmes in broad daylight in the middle of St. Petersburg and subsequently fled overseas. Um, for this reason, he was a, a wanted man and he moved around Europe frequently in order to uh, evade capture before he eventually decamped um, to London in 1884. Um, during his time in uh, Britain, Kravchinsky became in many respects the, the public face of uh, the Russian emigration, if not the revolutionary movement altogether so far as the Western public was concerned. Um, he wrote very regularly for the English press. Um, he published an impressive number of books and pamphlets, um, of which the, the most famous is uh, Underground Russia, Papola Russia, which uh, first came out in um, 1883. 
Uh, he appeared pub re regularly at public meetings and rallies, and he maintained um, close contacts not only with the British socialist movement, uh, but with the literary and, uh, and cultural avant-garde of the day. Um, he died in a freak accident in December 1895 when he was hit by a train on an unmanned uh, level crossing near his home in Chiswick. Um, Volkovsky had uh, again been uh, prosecuted for his revolutionary activities in the 1870s. Um, he'd been a, a defendant in one of the largest political trials of uh, that decade, the so-called trial of the 193 or uh, Bolshevik Pretsias in, in Russian. Uh, and as a result, he spent most of the 1880s in exile in Siberia. Um, he escaped across the Pacific in 1889 by, by flagging a ride on a, a, a Vladivostok steamer. And uh, a year later, uh, he arrived in London via North America. Um, during his time in London, at least his early years in London, uh, Volkovsky acted mainly as Kravchinsky's second in command, and he kept up a grueling schedule of public lectures and other propaganda activities throughout the 1890s. And in later life, Volkovsky became one of the elder statesmen of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. So Kropotkin, Kravchinsky and Volkovsky were therefore united in the first place by their common political uh, origins. Indeed, all three of them had been either members of or proximate to the um, so-called Tchaikovsky uh, circle um, of the early 1870s, uh, so named for its leader, Nikolai Tchaikovsky, uh, who not uncoincidentally had also been living in London as an emigre for several years by this time. More to the point, however, all three of them were highly literate and charismatic cultural chameleons who could convincingly make the case for the righteousness of the revolutionary cause um, before the court of public opinion, as it were. Uh, as we shall see shortly, uh, all three of them uh, either spoke and wrote excellent English or were quick studies. They all cut respectable figures and moved very easily in middle class English society. And by the same token, however, uh, they were not above uh, indulging English stereotypes about Russia and sort of thrilling their audiences with revolutionary melodrama if it got them attention. Although, admittedly, this is much more the case with um, Kravchinsky and Volkovsky than it was with Kropotkin. Now, at this stage, um, you may be wondering why the London emigres cared so much about winning over um, foreign public opinion. Of course, in the end, what difference did it make? At this juncture, we need to note the apparently genuine belief held by both the aforementioned and various other revolutionaries of the time, but crucially scorned by many more, that international public opinion could, if correctly leveraged, somehow prove decisive in the struggle against autocracy in Russia. Kravchinsky is the leading proponent of this idea, um, which he set out in uh, the utmost detail in an American magazine article uh, published in 1890 under the, um, the title What Americans Can Do for Russia. Um, he writes, my dream is, is to see you one day, a new crusade started in the West against the great sinner of the East, the Russian Tsardom, to see an army spring into existence, not a host, but a well-selected army like that of Gideon, uh, composed of the best men of all three nations with unlimited means at their command, making common cause with the Russian patriots, fighting side by side with them, each with their appropriate weapons, until that nightmare of modern times, the Russian autocracy, uh, is conquered and compelled to accept the supremacy of the triumphant democracy. To conquer the world for the Russian Revolution, to throw upon the scales the huge weight of the public opinion of civilized nations, this was the dream that glistened before me. Um, and I think you can you can see quite clearly here how he's not only sort of sanitizing the, the struggle against Tsarism, but he's explicitly presenting it in this uh, in the language of you know enlightened Victorian Protestants and sort of talking about like a, an army like that of Gideon. Um, talking about liber liberty and patriotism and democracy and all, all, all he's, he's borrowing the, the language of his audience effectively. Now, although he seems sincerely to have believed this stuff, neither Kravchinsky nor his closest associates in the emigration were ever able to explain precisely how we, this was meant to work. And um, here we should note the view that was often expressed in Akhana reports of the 1890s and by Roshkovsky in particular, that Kravchinsky's publicly expressed uh, views were actually humbug and that the overseas immigration, as it were, was merely a way of sort of leaning on British public opinion in order to 
a pushback against Russian demands for the extradition of the leading emigres. Uh, in other words, the idea was to simply keep Britain as, as a safe haven until such time as revolutionary action once more became possible in Russia itself. Rashkovsky was not alone in his skepticism. Um, indeed, most of the leading revolutionaries of the time uh, made plain that they considered these ideas of Kravchinsky's to be extremely naive and basically wishful thinking. Uh, and an additional source of irritation, of course, was his um, tendency to use terms like our party or our plan of action uh, in his writings, which gave the impression that he was speaking on behalf of the revolutionary movement as a whole. Uh, and this was um, particularly grating for Plikhanov Sasulich and uh, the other emigre leaders of Russian Marxism who were living in Switzerland at the time, um, because they most definitely did not share his political views. Nonetheless, the 1880s and the early 1890s were a time of retreat and retrenchment in the history of the revolutionary movement. And for this reason, the, um, the London emigres were given license, mainly for want of any better ideas, to kind of run with this stuff for the time being. So as a result, the late 1880s and the early 1890s are a really unique period in the history of the Russian emigration in London. On the one hand, Britain continues to play its nice traditional role as a bolt hole from uh, police persecution on the continent and uh, as a, a safe haven for, for radical publishing. On the other hand, it takes on at the same time a new role, uh, that of a, a megaphone, as it were, through which the message of the Russian revolutionary movement could be broadcast to the outside world. Um, these functions were fulfilled respectively by two officially separate but actually closely connected front organizations for the London emigres. Um, the first of these was the Free Russian Press Fund, or Fond Volovsky Presi, uh, which was founded as a printing press in the, the Herzen style in 1891 and became fully active in 1893. Um, the fund published its own uh, newspaper under the rather demure title of Litucci Listki, or leaflets. Uh, as well as a, as a vast range of literature that could not be um, published in Russia at the time, including translations of Marx, uh, works by Chernyshevsky and uh, Vladimir Korolyanko's um, stories. For many years, the fund uh, ran a bookshop at number 15 Augustus Road in Hammersmith, which was across the road from uh, Volkovsky's flat. Um, the historical significance of the fund is mainly that it, it was at the time um, the, the only Russian emigre press in Europe that was worth a bean and was therefore the source of most of the um, illegal literature that circulated underground uh, in Russia during the 1890s. Um, also of interest is that it was uh, officially a, a bipartisan operation in that in addition to publishing uh, books and pamphlets written by its own members, it also published material on behalf of other revolutionary factions um, in due course, uh, however, this spirit of um, bipartisanship dissipated, and um, in the early 20th century, it um, uh, uh, it um, the, the, the members of the the fund affiliated to the Socialist Revolutionary Party. Um, the the second function, that of the overseas agitation proper, was fulfilled by the Society of Friends of Russian Freedom. Um, or SFRF for sure. The SFRF had uh, officially been formed uh, in, originally been formed in 1885 uh, by Kravchinsky in association with a, a group of left-wing English uh, intellectuals, including George Bernard Shaw and Annie Pizant, uh, who had become interested in Russian affairs via reading his books. Um, the first incarnation of the SFRF quickly fizzled out and the organization remained dormant uh, until 1889. Uh, when Kravchinsky was able to um, enlist the support of the chap on um, on the left here, Robert Spence Watson, uh, who is the president of the National Liberal Federation, i.e. of Gladstone's Liberal Party. Um, Spence Watson's connections at Westminster and his newfound zeal for freeing Russians from Tsarist oppression seemed to do the trick. And uh, in January of 1890, a large number of MPs, journalists, and other well-to-dos uh, unexpectedly received in the post an appeal for subscriptions on behalf of the Friends of Russian Freedom. Uh, this document, by the way, offered little explanation as to who said friends were, and still less any uh, mention of their connections to Russian emigres, uh, merely pledging to, and I quote, obtain for the Russian people such a free constitution as that which England has long enjoyed. The SFRF's name, Society of Friends, is a quite, a, quite an explicit nod to the devout Quakerism of Spencer Watson and various of its English members. Uh, and therefore, it was no surprise that the persecution of religious dissenters in, in Russia, and in particular of Jews in the Pale Settlement, uh, was one of the big uh, issues on which the society campaigned. <laughs> 
In general, however, the SFRF drew on a much longer tradition of Victorian liberal humanitarianism and uh, voluntary associations in support of various oppressed peoples around the world. Um, perhaps the literary association of the Friends of Poland, which existed in the 1830s and 1840s, is the most relevant example. The SFRF uh, existed from 1890 to 1914, so until the First World War. And during that period, it probably did more than um, any other organization to raise awareness of Russian affairs in Britain. Um, it's most visible um, achievement was its monthly newspaper, Free Russia, which you can see in the middle of the screen here, uh, which was edited jointly by Kraczynski and Spence Watson uh, first, and then mainly by Volkhovsky after Kraczynski's death. Free Russia regaled readers with vivid accounts of the revolutionary struggle and documented abuses of power by czarist officials, but it also sought to generate interest in Russian literature, culture and everyday life among its readers. Probably the SFRF's most eye-catching initiative was its campaign against the Siberian exile system in the, 18, or in the early 1890s. To, to a certain degree, the Victorian reading public had been weaned on Siberian gore and melodrama. The imagery of exiles trudging through um, snowy wastes in, in chains while pausing only for the occasional knighting uh, had been a sort of stock theme in uh, literary representations of Russia since the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and it had been significantly reinforced by the, the various Polish exile memoirs that had been published in English translation uh, after 1830 and 1833. So here again was an opportunity to leverage the sort of uh, stock Russian imagery or local colour that circulated in Victorian popular culture for political gain. Um, indeed, the SFRF's revival in 1890 was more or less directly occasioned uh, by a series of atrocities committed against political exiles in Siberia that had been um, widely reported in Western newspapers. Um, the Siberian horrors, as they uh, became known to contemporary parlance, um, generated widespread outrage among the liberal Victorian public, uh, only occasionally punctuated by queries as to whether uh, the British should really be con condemning in Russia what they themselves practiced in Ireland. In any event, the SFRS ensuing campaign to uh, free the exiles, quote unquote, absorbed um, most of its leading members' energies during the early 1890s. Um, Valkovsky, in particular, uh, escaped from Siberia more or less for the explicit purpose of leading this campaign, and he gave numerous public lectures during his, his, his early years in Britain detailing his own experiences in Siberia. Um, during these uh, lectures, he apparently often vanished off stage halfway through, only to reappear in dressed in convict garb and bound in chains. Um, this is a, a bit of stagecraft, uh, of which unfortunately there survived no photographs so far as I'm aware. Uh, that he borrowed from George Kennan, uh, an American journalist who um, had at the time recently published an, a lengthy expose of Siberian prison conditions uh, in the American press, uh, and, and whom Volkovsky himself had met in, in Tomsk in exile um, several years earlier. You can see a, a flyer for one of uh, Kennan's uh, lectures on the right here. Now, the SFRF um, proved very effective at whipping up public outrage on these and other issues. But in terms of visible outcomes, its impact was minimal. Unlike the Polish emigres of the previous generation, the Russians in London were never able to uh, attract the high level political support that they needed. Um, Tories were, for obvious reasons, not receptive to their message and the Liberal Party under Gladstone took a, a generally quite pro-Russian line. And in a way, this was nobody's fault because although it is hard to generalize, it is clear that British public attitudes towards Russia um, changed very considerably in the years leading up to the Anglo-Russian Entente of 1907 and the outbreak of the First World War. And this, in retrospect, was an insurmountable challenge for an organisation such as the SFRF, the success of which depended to a great extent on the ability of the emigres to leverage old Russophobic stereotypes for political gain. Moreover, as official Anglo-Russian relations began to improve, uh, the position of the London emigres became rather perilous. Uh, indeed, if Kraszynski's untimely death in 1895 first took the wind out of the SFRF sails, um, it was not undoubtedly the, um, the prosecution of another Russian emigre, Vladimir Burtsev, um, uh, for incitement to regicide in 1897-1898 uh, that marked the end of the SFRF's golden age. Uh, and Burtsev's prosecution was uh, an openly political prosecution offered by Lord Salisbury to Nicholas II as kind of olive branch in the run-up to the Entente. Um, I, I think Bob Henderson, who's re recently written an excellent book on Burtsev's life, uh, is here this evening and can maybe speak to that later. 
In the early 20th century, London remained an important emigre destination for Russians. Uh, of course, Lenin and the other Iskrovtsi um, spent time there, and both the Social Democrats and the Socialist Revolutionaries held party conferences in London from time to time. Uh, most famously, of course, it was at the 1903 Social Democrat um, Conference, which was held initially on Tottenham Court Road and subsequently in Whitechapel, uh, the, the Bolshevik-Menshevik split first took place. Uh, but the emigres would never again play such an important and visible role in British public life. It would be wrong, however, to conclude from this that the uh, the influence of these particular Russian emigres on British life um, stopped there. On the contrary, traces of their influence uh, can be found right across early 20th century British politics and culture. And I'm, by way of conclusion, just going to mention a few uh, pertinent examples. Um, so firstly, as I mentioned in passing earlier, the SFRF itself, and more generally the social circles in which Kropotkin, Krasinski and others moved, um, included many of the outstanding figures of the British Socialist Movement uh, from around the turn of the century, uh, among them Bernard Shaw, William Morris, uh, Annie Besant, and Henry Heinemann of the Social Democratic Federation. And now many of these figures, uh, both at the time and subsequently, acknowledged the impact that acquaintance with these Russian emigres had had on the development of their own political views. Um, Shaw and Morris uh, especially so. And therefore, I, I don't think it's far-fetched to suggest that, that the presence in that milieu of very specifically non-Marxist Russian socialists may help account in some, albeit very small way, for the very equally specific uh, non-Marxist course of development taken by British socialism and by the labor movement in the early 20th century. Another um, notable uh, presence in the SFRF's orbit um, during the 1890s was of course Emmeline Pankhurst. And it was through this connection that British suffragists uh, first discovered the tactic of hunger striking, which was first employed by Russian political prisoners in czarist jails in the late 19th century. Uh, several noteworthy cases were at various times publicized by Free Russia and by the London emigres. Um, hunger strikes were of course used by members of the Women's Social and Political Union, Union from 1909 onwards. And in general terms, it's fair to say that the British suffragists owed um, the women of the Russian revolutionary movement, not just this specific means of struggle, but much of the emotional dynamic that characterized the, uh, the Women's Social and Political Union's turn to militancy um, in the early 20th century. Um, Sylvia Pankhurst, as you can see here, for instance, d d describes uh, at one point how she uh, idealized Maria Spiridonova and other famous Russian revolutionary women of the time. Um, in the cultural sphere, too, the influence of the Russian emigres continued to be felt long after they themselves had receded from view. Um, and there's much we could say on this, but given that this lecture series would not be taking place without the uh, beneficent um, influence of Murren and Kathy's Rustrans project, it seems only fitting to point out that Costas Garnet uh, owed her beginnings as a literary translator to the London emigres. Uh, it was Volkovsky who originally taught her Russian at the beginning of the 1890s, and it was Kravchinsky with whom she collaborated on her early translations of Turgenev uh, during that, that same decade. So without them, the history of Anglo-Russian literary uh, translation would have been very different, and it is therefore quite ironic that one of the most um, visible manifestations of that fall in Anglo-Russian relations during the years of the Entente and up to the First World War was that the, the craze for Russian art and literature among the British educated classes that the emigres had helped, uh, albeit indirectly, to inspire. And uh, I think I'm going to end on that note because I think I have overrun the time allotted to me, but uh, thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you. Um... Let's see if there are any um, questions. Yeah, so um, one uh, from Corinna is asking, um, could you tell us a bit more about what Lenin was up to um, in his time in London? I'm sure probably a lot of you have seen his um, his blue plaque, which is very near Cease. Um, so what, what is there um, that's sort of uh, special about his time uh, and and the other social revolutionaries um, in the sort of sec second or the later part of that um, period. Um, I would personally rather not speak to Lenin's place in the London emigration myself because, I've, as I said earlier, I think Bob Henderson is here and is having just published an excellent book. Or uh, I haven't read it yet, but I, I hear an excellent book on the subject. Is much better place to speak to this than I am. Uh, Bob, are you here? Uh, let's see if we can hear from him. Um... Um, I don't see him in the 
unless it's under the command. Uh, I don't see him in the uh, audience. He, 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 he told me on Twitter that he, he'd register for this. Okay, I, I, I will I will try and speak to it in, in lieu of Bob. Um, Lennon he was in London mainly to um, publish Iskra in, initially. Um, he came to London for um, Social Democrat initially in the later Bolshevik party conferences and um, he primarily availed himself of the opportunity to work in the British Museum, the reading room of the British Museum, which is one of his most famous um, associations with uh, with London. Uh, anyone here who had the chance to visit the uh, the Russian Revolution exhibit at the British Library for the centenary several years ago will have uh, possibly seen Lenin's reading room ticket in one of the um, the, ex the exhibition cases. Um, my other, other questions that we, we have. Is that, is that okay? As, as I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, whether uh, it was time where social uh, revolutioners uh, or anarchists and Bolsheviks were together in London and was it quarrel among them? Um, the question of party relations in the emigration is, is an interesting one. Um, as far as I'm aware, most, for the most part, and particularly in the early 20th century, the, the various party groupings in, in London, so the, the socialist revolutionaries, anarchists, Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, very much get themselves to themselves. Um, in the earlier period, and the one I spent most time talking about, it, it, it's different. There is a lot more um, interaction between the various factions, which is partially a reflection of the fact that the um, the factional divisions in the Russian Revolutionary Movement are, are not as um, clear cut at that, at that time. The you know at the end of the nineteenth century, the, the sort of Marxist populist split has taken place. Um, but people like Plekhanov are still on on very good personal terms with people like Kravchinsky and, and Kropotkin. So there, there's quite a lot of interaction at, at that time. Um, but later on, it, it definitely becomes a lot a lot more exclusivist and a lot more factional. Mm. Great, very good question there. Um, here's one from Mart. Uh, how did the 1905 revolution affect the emigre community in London? I assume probably quite a um, few would have come over after that. Um, I believe quite a few of them tried to go back in 1905, but then it was, you know, we had to come back again um, afterwards. Um, 1905 was, was definitely a shot in the arm for the SFRF, which was uh, flagging by that point. I mean, Free Russia had gone bankrupt several times by that point. And, and yeah, the, the 1905 regenerated a, a lot of uh, interest in, in the Russian Revolution among the, the British educated public. Um, uh, and, and yes, uh, moments of revolutionary outburst in, in, in Russian, the emigrants who, who could generally went back or generally prepared to go back. Um, as, as, again, you can see in 1917. And the 1905 Aliens Act, did that affect um, the status of many of the emigres? Um, most of the, the emigres I've mentioned who were still alive at the time, were still in Britain at the time, were, um, were I think, canny enough to get, get around its provisions. Uh, I don't know very much about the um, the Aliens Act, it, it, it was more directed at, at, at the regulation of um, mass migration, particularly from from the Pale of Settlement. There was a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of sort of moral, moral and social panics uh, about, about um, uh, particularly Jewish emigration from from the Pale uh, at in the in the run up to the um, the Aliens Act passage through, through Parliament. Um, you know, I, 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 quite famously, it was believed for some time that there there had been some um, some some Jewish migrant involvement in the, the Jack Ripper case, um, so the, the, there's a lot of a lot of panic about, about, about this stuff. But it, it's not really the Aliens Act is not really targeted at uh, literate, charismatic representatives of the Russian intelligentsia. It, it, it's directed at uh, J Jewish sweated labour in the East End, effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that the Ukraina didn't have any. Um sort of official arrangement like with the police as they had done in France or Switzerland. But um, what was their presence in London at the time? 
Um, so when the Society of Friends of Russian Freedom was was revived in 1890, uh, this caused a bit of a panic in the the MVD in the police department in Petersburg, and. Um, when Free Russia starts to appear in news agents and, and the um, uh, the Emirates hold, hold, hold this big demonstration in solidarity with Siberian exiles in Hyde Park in March of 1890, again, on which again, Bob Henderson has written an excellent article. Um, at this point, uh, Rashkovsky writes to his superiors in Petersburg saying that, that, that there's, there's some stuff going on in London. This is not good. We need to or, we need to organise a, a London residency with utmost um, urgency. And he, he gets some funding to do this. Um, it, it's quite a ramshackle uh, operation, at least initially. Um, uh, and it's it's not really until the end of the 1890s that the um, the Akrana have have, a, have a, a sort of serious presence in in London. Um, the the level of cooperation uh, between Scotland Yard and the overseas Okrana was very minimal uh, originally, but it became much more extensive later on in in the decade. Um, uh, and, and again, particularly in connection to Bordsev's trial in uh, in eighteen ninety eight, um, uh, that that was the, 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 the case of the prosecution in, in, involved uh, cooperation between, between the Crown Prosecution Service and the Okrana, so well, um, yeah um, there are a lot of great questions coming in so I might have to slightly synthesize a couple of them um, so one from Lisa says did the emigre spread out beyond London to anywhere else in the UK and we well, actually outside London and somebody Sarah replies that in fact they live opposite the house that Kropotkin occupied in Brighton so um, obviously they did um, spread out slightly further than London. Yeah. Maybe only a short train right away. But could you say anything about whether there were sort of any centres of activity outside of London? Um, not centres of activity so far as I am aware. It's certainly the um, the kind of lectures and agitational activities organised by the the, the, the emigres of the 1890s and 1890s uh, were nationwide and Valkovsky in particular um, spent years and years sort of beating a trail around literary philosophical societies all, all across the country. Um, that's not really the same thing, of course. Um, so some did move outside London, as you say, Kropotkin spent some time in, in, in Brighton. He also lived in Bromley for quite a while. So I think we would not really consider it to be a part of London these days, debatable. Um, uh, also, when, actually, when Kropotkin first came to Britain in the 1870s, he he, uh, he spent more time in Edinburgh, I believe, than he did in um, in London. But other than that, no, no not, not really any major centres of activity outside of London that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, here's a very good question. Um, were there any links between refugee groups and sort of political emigres and Jewish Russian immigrants in the East End? And did, actually, I'm going to ask a separate, slightly extra question. Did the, their presence kind of influence the politics of the uh, existing Jewish and Russian population in London? Um... That's a really interesting question. Uh, the short answer is yes and yes, although I, I'm, I'm less certain on the latter point than on the, the former. Um, certainly the, yes, the, the emirates that I talked about were aware that the, the Jewish population of, of the East End were um, potentially very, very, obviously very sympathetic towards their cause. Uh, the uh, Valkovsky and Kravchinsky helped to organize a, a free Russian library in Whitechapel in the I want to say late 1890s, so that, that, that might be wrong, which was in, intended a, a, as, as an educational institution for Jewish refugees. Um, the Russian emigrants who had lived in London before this point, particularly Lavrov in the 1870s, had also been in, involved in the, the agitation for, for, um, for, for labour rights and, and, and for, for, uh, for, um, you know, uh, for, 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 for trade unionization among the Jewish working class. So um, La uh, Lavrov and, and Kraplovkin at the end of the 1870s, beginning of the 1880s, was both speak at, at um, J Jewish political rallies in, in the East End. Um, and those connections between the, 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 the sort of the Russian emigre as su uh, emigration as such and the, the 
the, the Russophone Jewish population of, of the East End, that continues well into, into the 20th century. There are other, other influences on um, the, the politics of the, of the, the, the Jewish working class in the East End as, as well. Um, I'm, less, uh, I'm, I'm less up on that. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> I think I think it does, yeah. Um, so another one, another couple of questions ask about um, the influence, uh, the sort of cultural influence of these emigres on the emerging interest in translation, and for example, Constance Garnett. Um, so do you, do you think there was a sort of boost? I mean, the first English translations of Russian had obviously come a few, almost a hundred years before then, but um, yeah. there, there's a certain golden period of uh, translation started certainly around about that time. So did that, uh, were those two things very closely linked? Was there kind of political aspect to the translation? Um, there are several people in, in this event who will be able to speak to this better than I can, I think. Um, but for what it's worth, I think to put, to put it in extremely reductionist terms and apologies in advance for this, I think the presence of people like Raportkin and Kravchinsky in the sort of the literary, in the, in the milieu of the literary cultural avant-garde in the late 19th, 20th century um, contributed significantly to making Russian literature and culture cool uh, among the British educated classes. And I think that's a significant factor here. Um, also, in, in terms of what Russian literature, which Russian literature, which Russian novels are being translated uh, around this time? Um, certainly, the the fact that Constance Garnett chose to start with Turgenev is not coincidental. I mean, it wasn't her decision particularly; it was Kravchinsky's decision. He sort of foisted it upon her because he he thinks that, that you know, Turgenev is a, is a realist writer who who is, is very good at sort of just describing the social conditions in, in Russia and that this is the kind of thing that British the British educated classes need to be reading about in order to, to sympathize with um with with the Russian revolutionary movement um in in later years of course it, it goes in a, in a, a very different direction that the Emirates couldn't control and you you get the, all, all of this stuff about about, about Dostoevsky as a sort of national prophet who and you, you have to read Dostoevsky and, and Tolstoy in, in order to understand the Russian soul and all of this the kind of stuff that's, that's washing around in, in the years before the first world war but it, it initially yes the the, the emigrants are, are to some degree trying to to dictate which which Russian novels, which Russian authors the British public are reading. But, but again, again you know, the people here can say much more about this than I can. Um, a couple of people are asking about Conrad's The Secret Agent as a uh, key to understanding stereotypes of emigres. Um, can you say anything about um, Kropotkin, for example, was he suspected of being a kind of agent provocateur and is is the secret agent a useful kind of political uh, political history source? Um, I don't know a lot about Conrad. I, I'm not aware that Kropotkin was ever accused of being a double agent. Uh, although, of course, there, there were such figures in in the you know the, the revolutionary emigre environment at, at, at this time. Um, I know that the, the, the it, it, it is widely supposed that the, um, the, the the connections between the London Emirates and Edward Garnett in particular was one of Conrad's sources for for writing the Secret Agent, but I, I don't know a lot more about it than that. Um, a couple of questions are asking about the. Um the royal intermarriage between the um, British and the Russian imperial families. Um, did that kind of official um, cult, uh, sort of political uh, joining have any kind of um, influence on, on the way that emigres um, were treated or was it a completely sort of removed idea because there was uh, somebody mentioned that the Queen Victoria was never really happy herself about that intermarriage, and was that kind of linked to this uh, culture of Russians in London? Uh, I don't, I don't know, is the honest answer. But I, I don't think not from, from what I read. There's not a lot of 
Um, what's most between those, those, those two things now? Mm -hmm. um, so in the comments, uh, someone says that on the subject of Russian literary translators and the revolutionaries, um, there's a recent book by the co-founder of the Anglo-Russian Research Network, Rebecca Beasley, called Russomania. And the first chapter discusses exactly this topic. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, that's uh, obviously a good starting place. Yes, um, and we, can we, on, on that note, also mention uh, Matt, Matt Thompson's uh, book, Red Britain, which is also just come out. And Matt was, uh, again, the, 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 the other original co-founder of the Research Network. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and... Uh, in fact, from next week's uh, speaker, Kathy McAteer, we, um, there are a lot of good um, sources on Constance Garnett, including Richard Garnett's biography of her, uh, Carolyn Heilbrunn's biographical research into her, and for insight into her work as a translator, um, the biography of William Heinemann by Johnson John. And for a specific detail about Garnet's translations, um, Rachel May's translator in the text are the uh, sources to look at. So thank you. Um, another question here, um, and we've got time for a few more. Um, did the conservative and then liberal governments in the first decade of the 20th century change their responses to Marxist groups rather than towards non-Marxist groups when the fear, I suppose, uh, the subtext of this is the sort of early pre-Red Scare um, fear of Marxism. Um, I don't know. Um, I would like to find out more about that. So uh, that, that this is a question I will look into, but I don't know the answer at the moment. Mm -hmm. Having a look through. Um, um, let's see if there are any questions I wanted to ask. Um, so, um, obviously, you mentioned a couple of less familiar names um, than the sort of typical uh, Lenin, Hertz, and um, ones. Are, they, are these, um, can you give a uh, is it simply just because of the later uh, prominence of the Soviet Union and the rise of the Bolsheviks that we know less about these people in the West and that they're sort of less familiar to us? Yeah, so I, I think that's, it, it's fair to say that a, a lot of it is because there were many, many participants, significant participants in the history of the Russian revolutionary movement who were largely written out of the at least official histori historiography for a long time. Um, there is a lot that we, I think, have forgotten about the um, the alternatives to Bolshevism before and during the the, the alternatives from the left to Bolshevism before and during 1917 um, because of the way things turned out. So I think that that's one reason. I, I think another reason that um, the particular generation of emigres in London that I was talking about are not more widely known is because they were after the decline of the Society of Friends of Russian Freedom and after the assimilation of the Free Russian Press Fund into um, the Socialist Revolutionary Party, which sort of marked the, 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 the end of that sort of discrete phase of the, the London emigration. Um, the, the overseas agitation that I was talking about uh, was, I think, very largely seen by the revolutionary movement in general as kind of a, a, an experiment that had been at best only partially successful and, and in any case was no longer needed because the, the, the you know the, the pace of the Russian revolution is picking up again then you, you have 1905 revolution you, you the the the, the, um, the, the emergence of, of Russian social democracy and the labor movement in, in the big cities and, and it's it, it seems like a, re a relic of an earlier time that was sort of fun in its own in its own way but really not relevant to where Russia is socially and politically in the early 20th century so I, I think that that's another major reason why they they've kind of been Forgotten about, but I think they, they, they do illustrate a, a, quite, quite neatly that, that that point about the the complexities of and, and the, the hidden corners of political immigration. Mm 
Okay. Um, a question here about Hertz. And, um, did he have any British literary and philosophical uh, friends and influence? And also, uh, I think um, Ben did answer Schiffer's question when he mentioned that the 1905 Aliens Act was much more directed towards um, Jewish emigration from the Pale of Settlement. And but, but what was its effect in general, uh, do you know? Uh, the, the Aliens Act. Um, well, I mean, the, the immediate effect w w was that uh, mi migrants had to, had to be registered, uh, which was the um, the, the first time this had been, been, been done on, on a large scale. And we, we, I, I guess we, to some degree, we, we, we get our our modern immigration policy in, in this country from the 1905 Aliens Act. Like, like that's the statutory precedent for, for all of it. So it, it, it marks the, the end of one phase of complete indulgence uh, of emigres and migrants of, of all stripes and the beginning of a, a new, much more restricted phase, which is accompanied by, you know, the, the upsurgence of xenophobia and suspicion of foreigners and uh, fears that, you know, we, we, we need to close our borders and uh, can control all this sort of thing much, much more tightly. But as I say, this is, it is really directed at, at poor working class migrants. No, it's not. the The intention is is not really, to, as far as I've, I have understood it, the intention is not really to uh, clamp down really hard on um, sort of likable literate members of the Russian intelligentsia. That that's not where this is going at all. I I, I might be wrong, but mm -hmm. um, I've also I've seen a there's a question from Karina Lotz in the chat, did Hertzson have British literary and philosophical friends and influence? Um, should I just speak to that quite quickly? Uh, the, the, short, yeah, the, 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 the short answer is no. He, he, he tried to befriend Thomas Carlyle, but it, it didn't, I don't think it, it was a, a friendship that really lasted. If, if you, you read um, Hertzson's memoirs, I mean, most, most of what he, he talks about is connections with other democratic emigrants from 1848 and other Russians. Um, so even though he spent quite a lot, a long time in London, he, he didn't settle exactly in the, the fullest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. Um, quite an interesting one here from Mark. Um, did the Tsarist government itself engage in any kind of positive PR campaign in the UK to counter the, uh, the emigre's work? Yes, indeed. And I, I wanted to talk to, to speak to this actually, but I, I didn't really have the time um yes so the the the, the important person here is um uh, olga novikova or uh, madame novikov as she was known to contemporary uh, parlance this is um someone who she, she was from a an, an old russian noble family that had been associated with the slavophiles in the, in the early 19th century she came to um to london in the 1870s and she she quickly got involved with with um, Gladstone's uh, campaign against the, the, the Turkish atrocities in Bulgaria. Um, after this, she she developed a, a, a really vast network of um, contacts at, at, at Westminster and in, in the press. She has a, a column in the, in the Palmar Gazette for many years. And um, she, she she's really the, the, the sort of the point person for the, the Tsarist government. She's, she's the, the, the conduit through which they they, they, they lobby the, the British government unofficially and they also uh, try, try to influence literate public opinion. Um, and she, she, she's very she's very close to, to Gladstone and she's very close to other important politicians at, at, at this, this time. And, and she makes clear behind the scenes that you know, the, the, the Russian government takes, takes a very dim view of the indulgence of, of the, these emigres. Um, they, the, the, the Tsarist security organs did spend quite a, a lot of time in the late 1880s, early 1890s, make, making very, again, very clear to the British government that they wanted the leading emigres extradited. And um, again, they, they didn't really get anywhere with, with this un, until Burtsev's prosecution. And even then he wasn't extradited after his, uh, after his prison sentence ended. Um, and this is a source of intense irritation to Rushkovsky in particular. In his in the archival documents, he he, sa he sends these really hyperbolic reports back to Petersburg, where he he says, you know, the, the, the members of Parliament and the press have just got, gone, have tripped over themselves to in, in, indulge these 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 disgusting political criminals in in, in all of their conspiratorial 
the designs and, and the, the, the British are really, really gullible and they're really easily taken in by the, this, this sort of rhetoric of liberty and the struggle for freedom and all this kind of thing. And um, Rajkowski and Novikova work together to um, place articles in, in, the, in the London press defaming the emigres. And it's, it's actually through their intervention that the British reading public find out in January of 1894 that, that about Kraczynski's terrorist past. Um, nobody, apparently nobody at the time thought to ask the, the question of why the, um, the editor of the, the New Review had access to uh, secret Okhana files, but there you go. Mm. Um, I think let's uh, take these two last questions and then um, and let you get off. Um, first, uh, are there any film or dramatic works that capture these stories really well? Um, this sort of exile culture and um, this is from Andrew George who thinks is there a kind of antidote to Khachinyanko's Demon of the Republic etc? Not that I'm aware of, no. No, I've, I've never come across any, any um, film representations of um, uh, of, of exile. I mean, in, in terms of theatre, the only the only thing I can I can think of is um, Tom Stoppard's the, the Coast of Utopia, which obviously deals with person. But apart from that, I can't think of anything. If anyone knows of anything, I'd, I'd love to see it. Mm -hmm. And. Um... Having published your monograph uh, now, can you tell us briefly uh, on the, uh, in fact, you haven't quite published it yet, you've still got to get it in to Radledge. Um, can, you still, can you tell us briefly the ways in which you're taking your research forward? So are you doing mostly archival stuff at the moment? Um, so as, as Rafi says, I haven't quite finished it yet. I, I'm, I'm in a rather protracted race to the finish line, but I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing it in print uh, next year. Um, uh, I, I my my plan is to take a break from Anglo-Russian stuff for, for a while, uh, apart from hopefully can continue involvement with the research network. Not not because I I know I find it interesting, but just because I I've, I've been working on it for, for for about a decade now, and there there, there are other things I, I'd like to work on. So I, I have an, I have another project on um, uh, Russian, Russian religious thought and the revolutionary movement in the early twentieth century. That is that's my next. Thing. So um, yes, the, 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 I, I, I shall be taking a, a leave of absence from from Anglo Russian studies to to some degree for for a while after the book's done. Well, that's fair enough. Um, I think we'd probably better wrap it up uh, around about now. Um, but I would uh, like to say thank you to uh, Ben. It's been a br brilliant uh, talk. Uh, really, I mean, I, I, I think it, it's sort of one of those ones where it really um, expands our knowledge of something that we kind of think have a we have a sort of surface level understanding of but i think there's just a lot of more uh undercurrents and figures who we don't talk about or know about so it's really brilliant to to hear this so thank you ben and thank you to the um, anglo-russian research network for for organizing these talks um and the maslonova and Miran maguire the ones who brought it to us so um it's been a, a great sort of few weeks that we've had. We're halfway through and next week, next Friday, we've got Kathy McAteer talking on uh, the Penguin Russian Classics series. Um, so that'll be uh, one to look out for. Um, and if this talk um, has left you wanting to know a bit more about the post-1917 uh, emigres and refugees, ne the next week we have a talk on Wednesday um, by two Russian authors, Irina Baragan and Andrei Soldatov. We'll be talking about their new book, The Compatriots, which is about USSR's uh, emigres, exiles, and uh, agents abroad. So um, check that out if you're uh, left wanting more. Um, but uh, I'll just say thank you to everybody who's who's attended as well. Um, it's been a great, um, great audience, really. Um, knowledgeable and uh, very good questions from everybody. So thank you all very much and thank you, Ben. Uh, so thank you, thank you all again for tuning in. Answer the questions. Thanks. Goodbye.